Hello everyone, welcome to my channel, RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm finishing up my review of the classic A series of modules with A4 in the Dungeons of the Slave Lords. While it's not necessary for this review that you've watched the other videos in this series, a lot of my analysis draws from those reviews, so you may want to check them out when you're done here. Spoiler warning, this is an in-depth discussion of the contents of this module, so if you plan on playing it, you may want to stop now and direct your Dungeon Master to check this out because they may find what I talk about here useful. Otherwise, let's get started. A4 in the Dungeons of the Slave Lords was the final round of the TSR tournament at Gen Con 13 in 1980, and the entire affair was inspired by an adventure run by Harold Johnson, who ended up writing A2, Secret of the Slaver Stockade. In that adventure, he captured the characters and put them in a Minotaur's maze bereft of all their stuff, and the challenge was to escape the lair with their lives. At the time, this was quite the original idea, and the entire Slave Lord series was designed to get the characters to the situation they find themselves at the beginning of this module. Basically stripped naked and dropped into a deadly dungeon filled with monsters and traps where they have to fight their way out to survive. This is an especially great concept for a tournament module as so much of the success is predicated on player ingenuity and quick thinking rather than character statistics and dice rolls. Played as part of an ongoing campaign, this has the potential of being a complete and total disaster for reasons I'll get into in just a moment. As I've said in each of these reviews, the concept of an evil band of slavers raiding coastal towns and kidnapping citizens to be sold into slavery is a great one. It gives the heroes a clear-cut enemy and goal. The problem in each module was poor execution, or at least as far as campaign play goes, due to the needs of tournament play. In this module especially, every previous problem now feeds upon itself until we end up with a rather untenable situation, where it's simply not possible for the characters to defeat the slave lords. Their organization is too vast and widespread, and their stronghold is too defensible and well-maintained for the party of adventurers who end up naked in the dungeon to reasonably emerge victorious. The solution to the problem by the designers is to introduce the inevitable eruption of the volcano and the unavoidable destruction of the slaver city and island. Essentially, the entire point of these modules is negated as the natural disaster and destruction of the slaver's stronghold was going to happen anyway, whether the PCs intervened or not. At the end of A3 Assault on the Area of the Slave Lords, the PCs made their way to a hidden island that resided in a lake inside the mouth of an extinct volcano. There they infiltrated the slaver city of Sutterham, and with the help of various agents found a secret entrance to the slaver's stronghold through the sores of the city. Unfortunately, the Slave Lords knew they were coming as they had been watching the PCs progress through a crystal ball and laid a trap that resulted in the hero's defeat. Regardless of how railroady this is, the concept for this dungeon has the potential to be a lot of fun, so hopefully the players will recognize it for what it is. The module, as written, has the PCs waking up relatively healed in cells where they are kept prisoner for weeks. Eventually the volcano the island is on begins to rumble and show signs of possible eruption. In order to quell the angry god, the PCs are knocked out with gas, then dumped in the dungeon of the slave lords as sacrifices to appease the earth god. After that, the characters wake up in area one on the map. They are wearing loincloths, and that's it. The module does throw the PCs a bone by having an ally from one of the lords who originally sponsored this foray against the slavers drop down a bunch of magic user and illusionist spell scrolls in tubes 
which are lying in the dungeon floor when the PCs wake up. Of course, they can't read them at this point because they're in complete darkness. This is helpful and annoying at the same time. First of all, if the ally could have dropped down this many scroll spells, couldn't he have at least dropped down some flint and tinder? How about a dagger or two? To further annoy the players, the module has it so the constant tremors from the volcano will shake the sand so that the characters can't even use their footprints to retrace their steps while in this cavern maze. Really, this module just grates on my DM sensibilities here, but most of this is the result of the module's use in a tournament. Clearly, this module has a ton of issues the DM will probably want to address, and I'm going to make suggestions on how to fix every single one of these. But before I get into all of that, let's take a look at a few of the fun encounters the dungeon itself actually has to offer. Area 6 is a real opportunity for the characters. It's a lair of kobolds whose tribe is basically dying off after the slave lords sealed off the tunnels. They have meager treasure, but what they do have is spears, slings, and clubs, and one of them even has a shield. Useful for kobolds, but in the hands of people with the skill level of the player characters, quite deadly. Getting through the first few kobolds might pose a small challenge, but the PCs will probably be able to quickly overwhelm these poor creatures and take their stuff. Unfortunately, that will leave the remaining females and pups helpless and undefended. Area 7 is a pool of pitch, which ultimately can be used to create torches. Area 8 is a giant ant slayer. This will prove to be a challenge if the characters haven't managed to arm themselves to this point. What's really interesting about this place is the bridge over the chasm, which is constructed of the dried out husks of ant bodies. Heads, legs, and the like stick out in all directions. The entire thing held together by a rather strong glue-like substance. Interestingly enough, the bridge can be picked up as its total weight is only 300 pounds. The center section can be dismantled as the ant mandibles can be opened and closed like a vice locking the sections together. Area 10 is a giant crab's lair, part of it underground. There is a detailed map that shows this area much clearer. There are some ad hoc drowning rules here as well, and if the characters are clever, they can find an exit through the underwater cave network that emerges on the shoreline. Area 12 is the home of a giant crayfish. Its lair mostly underwater. The pool area is visible from the cave passage, but a character will have to swim underwater to find the large inner cavern and its fearsome occupant. Area 16 is my absolute favorite area in the dungeon. This is the module that introduced the Myconids to D&D, and this first encounter is really kind of freaky. Myconids are an intelligent race of fungus, and in general they are peaceful, but they have some really interesting and bizarre abilities, which are on full display as the characters enter this section. The Myconid King has released several spores that have allowed him to animate the corpses of a human, two giant worker ants, a kobold, and a beetle. Obviously, these appear as undead, but are not turnable for... These fungus freaks act as guards to the area, and the weirdness is just beginning as the PCs make their way through the place. The Myconids' houses are hollow, puffed, shaped fungus. The entryway in and out of them are a 5 foot to 9 foot ooze membrane, which are self-sealing. The myconids just step through them. It's entirely possible that any combat can be avoided if the PCs allow for it. The king can emit a spore that will allow him to communicate with them telepathically. The king will be open to telling the PCs about the exit chimney in room 19, but before revealing the location, he will try to get the PCs to kill the giant crayfish in Area 12. Now, the module mentions that the king can brew potions and has several available, but makes no mention of how the PCs might acquire them, except by combat. 
my suggestion is that if they are successful with the crayfish mission and the relationship with the Myconids has been cordial, perhaps even indulging in a melding ceremony with the group, in addition to the information, a kind DM might reward the group with a healing potion brewed by the king. The king actually has several potions available, a healing potion, a potion of invisibility, growth, speed, and water breathing, and if things go well, the king might offer them a choice of two. Area 17 is a roper's lair, and if the PCs haven't armed themselves well by this point, they could prove to be quite deadly. Area 19 is the chimney exit revealed by the Myconid King. It is blocked by a large chasm, but crafty characters might think of using the ant bridge from Area 8. Regardless, once the PCs emerge from the Dungeons of the Slave Lords at one of these areas marked on the map of the island, they will discover that the entire thing is on fire from the erupting volcano. They now have a limited amount of time to make their escape before they succumb to either the fire or poisonous gas fumes. It's a fight to get off the island, either by swimming for it, stealing a fishing boat, or making their way to the slave lord's ship, the Water Dragon, to recover their equipment. There they can have a final battle with the remaining slave lords. The slave lords encountered are not the ones faced in the railroad combat at the end of assault on the area of the slave lords. These guys are no pushovers, and the PCs had better have a good plan before they face them. There is the 11th level High Priest Dalman Klim, the 7th level Half Orc Assassin Theg Narlet, the Drow Fighter, level 5, Cleric level 4, Edralv, a level 10 Thief Slippery Ketta, the level 8 Illusionist Lamonston, and the 6th level Monk Brother Karen. Still a tough lot, especially if the PCs have not recovered their equipment. Okay, now let's address the four core issues with this module. The first part of the problem with this concept is that in order to get the PCs to the dungeons at some point need to railroad them into it, put them in an unwinnable situation and then lay down the hammer. It's a rare DM that will be able to pull that off without the players being the wiser and possibly harboring some resentment. The second part of the problem is how the entire series goes about getting them to this point. Three modules are spent building up this powerful organization where nine members are either equal to or higher level than the PCs. The third issue is that the Slave Lord's stronghold is a nigh-impregnable fortress city on the lake in the middle of a dormant volcano. Thus, any help from superior forces will not be forthcoming. By all rights, the PCs have no chance to succeed here. And finally... Realizing issues 2 and 3 in order to bring all of this to a somewhat satisfying conclusion, the module author has the volcano erupt, wiping out the stronghold and leaving the slave lords vulnerable to attack from the city lords who hired the PCs as they flee. Certainly fleeing from an erupting volcano makes for an exciting adventure, and in the heat of play, hopefully, no one will notice that essentially the ending is negating the need for the player character's involvement to begin with. Certainly there will not be a very satisfying rescuing of the slaves scenario, as many slaves will perish helpless trapped in cages in Sutterham. It's important to note that the volcano ending was tacked on with the release of the module and not part of tournament play. This module was written by Lawrence Schick, author of the classic module White Plume Mountain. Schick was head of TSR Design and Development at the time of this module's publication. He hired Tom Maldvey and many other great people at TSR, so his talent is without question. What this boils down to is running this as part of an ongoing campaign, as opposed to running this as a tournament one-shot, in which case none of the issues I mentioned matter. So let's address the problem here and see if we can't engineer a more interesting and satisfying conclusion. Certainly what I'm suggesting is just my own version of things, but perhaps some of the things I mention will resonate with you and inspire you to create your own amazing conclusion to what should be an epic series of adventures. First, there's no getting around the railroad defeat of the PCs at the end of Assault on the Area of the Slave Lords if you want to play out the dungeon scenario in A4. 
A Force dungeon is kind of the point of the entire thing. Certainly, the idea of being trapped in a dungeon and finding a means to escape with just the loincloth and your wits is an intriguing one. But the DM will need to make sure the players buy into this so as not to avoid mistrust. As I said in my previous video on A3, this should be out of character for you as the DM. So if your players are enjoying what you're doing and the story so far, they'll probably be willing to play along to see where this goes. But now you have to reward their trust. The first thing I would do is eliminate the entire erupting volcano scenario, at least initially, but I'll get back to that in a moment. After their defeat at the end of A3, they just wake up in the dungeon. No weeks in cages and being gassed to sleep in order to satisfy the Earth God. The slave lords consider being trapped in their dungeon tunnels to be eaten alive or starving to death a great form of execution and punishment for those who dared think to oppose them. PCs who supposedly died in combat were really just knocked unconscious. This means that the PCs will probably be low on hit points to start off, but that's fine. The contact they made in Sutterham will drop off some scrolls of healing, as well as some daggers and the spells listed in the module. Now, if you've foreshadowed correctly and established this NPC well during the lead up to the PCs entering the sores in the previous module, this may not be that big a shock to them. Be sure to include a note from the NPC as in the module noting that their equipment has been loaded on board the slave lord ship, the Water Dragon, and that the ship is set to depart in two days, thus setting up some time pressure on when they need to escape this dungeon. Since there won't be constant tremors, the shifting of the sand floor of the place will be no longer an issue. Basically, from this point on, just play out the module as written with this one major exception. Now, it's... At this point that I would inject a bit of Lovecraft, though you can totally foreshadow this as well in your opening to A3, perhaps someone they talk to will have a few rumors about this ancient crater that the slave lords have adopted for their stronghold. Some say it's not a natural formation, but was created by a mysterious ancient long dead race said to possess advanced magic and so on. Furthermore, at some point, hopefully long before you even introduce the Slave Lord storyline, you have the party discover a strange-looking artifact in one of their dungeon explorations. It's made of gold and platinum and radiates a minor magical aura. Consultation with sages will be unable to determine its purpose. Even an identify spell will be useless, but some sages will suggest that it is the key to some sort of vast treasure vault. Try as they might, however, the PCs will never be able to discover what it is the key is to. Anytime they might consider selling the key, you should look at them in DM and say, are you sure you want to do that? During their exploration of the Slave Lord's dungeons, a dwarf will notice, or really anyone with a high intelligence if a dwarf isn't present, a peculiar rock formation in one of the walls. Careful examination of the area will uncover a strange-looking three-fingered hand indentation. Placing one's own hand into the thing, shaping the hand like a Vulcan salute, will give the characters a tingling sensation, and by concentrating and making an intelligence check will cause a secret panel to open, revealing a sharply descending oval-shaped corridor. Dwarves will recognize this as resembling a lava tube, though it's clear that this has been manually created. The corridor will descend sharply for about a thousand feet until finally a bright orange glow can be seen at the end of it. As they approach the opening, it gets hotter and hotter and extremely loud, like one would hear standing near a large waterfall. Finally, the PCs emerge into a vast cavern on a small outcropping with a huge lava fall that descends thousands of feet into an abyss. Above can be seen a massive chimney that probably leads to the surface. On the outcropping the PCs emerge onto from the tunnel is a rectangular metallic structure about three feet high with an angled surface. 
There is a definitive looking knob and a series of what looks like glowing gems blinking on and off. Finally, there is a peculiar symbol that matches exactly the mysterious key they had discovered months ago, which is now with their equipment on board the Water Dragon. Careful examination of the area by dwarves or anyone able to make a good intelligence check will allow them to figure out that this entire thing is some kind of levee constructed to redirect the lava flow to prevent it from flooding the island. Who built it is a mystery, but the DM should endeavor to make sure it's all alien, strange, and ancient in a Lovecraftian sort of way. Ideally, the players will have a lot of fun trying to figure out what the device is. So now, at this point, the setup is complete. You've given the PCs a means by which to overcome the powerful slave lords, and the time pressure to recover their equipment is really important if they are going to get back to the key and return to this place. How long it will take the redirected lava flow to flood the island should be a matter of days or even hours, giving the PCs enough time to rescue some slaves, combat, fleeing slave lords, and the like. This still allows for an epic and exciting conclusion. Certainly there will be tension as the PCs try to sneak on board the water dragon to retrieve their equipment, but it's all on the terms of the player characters. How all of this plays out is left to their ingenuity, not the fickle fate of a natural disaster that conveniently intervenes on their behalf. You may want to map out the newly created levee area, but it's not necessary. In addition, you may not want to put the secret door in a fixed location on the dungeon map until it's actually detected. Simply have it detected at the dramatically appropriate moment, wherever they are on the map at the time. Artwork in this module is by Earl Otis, Jim Rosliff, Steve Sullivan, David Sutherland III, Gene Wells, and Bill Willingham. The cover art is classic Earl Otis, as is the cover page with the cave fissure. The rest of the artwork is serviceable, and Jim Rosloff has a few standout pieces as well. Acquiring a copy of this classic module is not that difficult as it was widely distributed, running between $15 and $30 depending on condition and completeness. A print-on-demand copy is available at DriveThruRPG for just $10.50. So let's take a look at A4 in the Dungeons of the Slave Lords on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. Style-wise, this module's fine. This is your classic early 1980s trade dress, and all classic D&D artists are present and contributing some great action pieces that reflect well what's happening in the module. I'll rate this a 16. Presentation is where this module falters. Bound within the constraints of tournament play, the module attempts to bring an interesting reverse dungeon concept to life and in many ways succeeds in creating a challenging and fun scenario. However, the railroading into the story and the tacked on island destruction at the end does not translate well into campaign play. Thus, DMs will have to either plan ahead and carefully craft an alternate ending or play things out as written in hope that no one notices that the entire affair was pointless as they run for their lives from the lava. I know that many people remember this module quite fondly, and certainly that's a testament to the DMs who ran it. All nostalgia aside, I can't help but find annoyance at some of the module's conceits and contrivances, and for that reason, I'm going to rate this a 12. Finally, let's look at value. Getting this module now is not going to break the pocketbook in the least, either through eBay or print-on-demand at DriveThruRPG, but in all likelihood the DM will have to spend some time re-evaluating some things to wrap this epic adventure up in a satisfying way, so I'll rate this a 17. That brings my overall rating for A3 in the Dungeons of the Slave Lords to a 15 good. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this review helpful and interesting. I know I went off the rails a little bit with my alterations to the scenario, but hopefully that you found what I suggested useful. I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreons for helping out and supporting the channel. Please click that subscribe button and ring the little bell so you'll get notifications when I upload more content like this. Like, comment, share. Visit the RPG Review Facebook group and consider supporting the channel by becoming a Patreon yourself. As always, my friends, 
May your D20 roll true and game on.